Director Peter Jackson is here. While you may not have heard of his first two films, Bad Taste and Meet the Feebles, or even his 1994 Oscar-nominated Heavenly Creatures, you most certainly have heard about his latest. It is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. It has grossed over $700 million to date and has been nominated for 13 Academy Awards, including three for Jackson, Best Film, Best Director, and Best Adapted Screenplay. The film is based on the first of the three mythological novels by J.R.R. Tolkien. It is the story of a hobbit named Frodo and his quest to keep a magical ring out of the hands of evil. Here is a scene from the film. The language is that of Mordor, which I will not utter here. Mordor? In the common tongue, it says one ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, fight! Not with that, Jack. I am pleased to welcome Peter Jackson to this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank and you. congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Is this the movie you set out to make? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very interesting because uh, as, a, as a director, I, I kind of, I, I have quite a good ability at, at the very beginning when we're first starting to write the screenplay, I have quite a good begin uh, ability to imagine the film in my head. Like, you know, even the very first page of, of, of the script, as we do it, I can start to imagine the camera angles, the music, I can start to feel how the film's coming together, and I sort of have this imaginary film starting to be put together. And that's right back at the beginning, and uh, I mean, in this case, we started this process about five or six years ago. And then what happens during the course of the movie is that this this film that's playing in my head always gets modified because as you design the sets, you know, then the sets that we've designed replace the ones that I originally sort of imagined. And then as the actors come on board, their faces put fit into the characters I imagined. And so my little internal movie is always changing and being updated. So that um it's it's you know, it always ends up better. Everything, every time my film in my head gets changed, it's it's improving all the time <laughs> oh, because all these all these other people yeah. are coming on board and giving their input yeah. in, in, in into it. And so um yeah, I mean I, I'm incredibly proud of the film. I I you know, it's well I mean the reality is it's probably better than what I what I imagine because I you know, I imagined something at the beginning. I didn't imagine Ian McKellen playing Gandalf at the beginning. You know, and when he comes on board, wow, and Elijah Wood and all the other actors. It's um so it's exciting. Creatively, it's exciting because you, uh, there's always new things happening when everybody else gets involved. Yeah. What's amazing about it is that you have made three films in one yes. span of time. Yes. No. Yes. But uh, that was, it's really, you know, a tribute to New Line Cinema, to Michael Lynn and Bob Shea, because they, they've taken a gamble that I think will probably go down in history as one of the all time. Ga you know Hollywood gambles because yeah. you know nobody nobody has ever said we'll pay for three films three big budget expensive complicated films yeah. we'll shoot them all together before we release the first one because we don't even know if the first one's going to succeed or not at the box office I mean it's a hell of a risk and a hell of a burden on I mean a hell of a weight for you to carry yeah yeah it, it, it has been I mean there hasn't been a single day while we were shooting that we that we didn't feel that weight that you didn't feel the weight of, we've got a oh, lot the, riding on this. Oh, the responsibility. I mean, the fate of the studio, to some degree, we were told, was, was riding on these movies, that um, it would be, it would have disastrous consequences for the studio, for the company, if these films didn't work, or the first film didn't work, in actual fact. Did you, as you were making these, I mean, can we expect the second and third? The first is out, there's a lot of mm. good reviews when you look at all the nominations, mm. and people mm. are saying terrific things about it, for mm. the most part. Mm. Do you think the second film and the third film will match that? I mean, well, they, they that's have, the other they, side. They have to be better, don't, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they have to be because that's sort of the way it needs to work. Um, it, it's an interesting process because what you have to imagine is that I, I'm not really in a position now as, as the, you know, the director of the Fellowship of the Ring, which was released at Christmas, and, right. it's, and it's been, as you say, reasonably successful. I, I'm not in the I say reasonably successful. Yeah. I, I'm not really in the position to sort of say, okay, now I'm about to start working on the next film, so I've got to now do this, this, and this to the next film to make it bigger and better. And where we had this in the first one, we're going to have ten of those in the second one. You know, yeah. because I'm not really in that position because they're, they're all filmed. They were all done at the same time. Yeah. So 
uh, to some degree, even though we're editing, we, you know, we're cutting the movies and we're still able to do a yeah. little bit of creativity and shaping and things, there's definitely more opportunity for that. Um, the films, the films are what they are. The three of them were shot together at the same time. They're a continuation of the same yeah. story. So if you like the first one, you should like the second one. Yeah, and even more we, so we because made, you'll be more into the we, story. We made it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, they were all filmed together. You know, so we were we were just on on a roll, <laughs> yeah. going through this great sort of essentially nine hour story. Now, where, what's the status of second and third? Well, there, there's rough cuts of both those films. Um, I mean, I've I've seen them both, and they're very 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 rough form. And what we're doing now with the second one, because that's where all, all of our attention is, is on the second movie, um, and I'm about halfway through doing a proper kind of fine cut. Here you are at 18 years old mm. in New Zealand, mm. English parents who moved to New Zealand, yep. uh, lived there, early on began to make little 8 millimeter films. Yeah. At 18 years old, you read Toykin, yep. right? Yep, I did, yeah. At 34, Mm -hmm. You start making the movie. Yeah, 34, 35. Began, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 the yeah. whole process. Yes. You're now 40, 41? 40, yeah. 40. Yeah. yeah. With, You're with investing them, with a lot of your time. Yes. Yes, I mean, it's going to be eight years. But from the beginning to, to the end of the third movie, when we release it next Christmas, um, it's, it's going to be eight years. But I, well, I mean, I, I mean, I think they're eight years incredibly well spent. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker, as you say, ever since I was a 10-year-old. And... You know, the Lord of the Rings, but for somebody that loves escapist cinema like I do, that loves visual effects, that loves films that sort of transport you away, and that's what I want to do with my life. I mean, I'm very, very lucky. I'm one of those people that get to do their hobby as a career, yeah. basically. And that's knew what I early when you wanted to do. Yeah, and, and, but I, you know, I, I regard myself as being incredibly lucky, and especially, you know, I, I mean, the Lord of the Rings is the ultimate project. I mean, why wouldn't I want to spend eight years on three Lord of the Rings films? I mean, wh why not? Yeah. It, it is the wonderful book to adapt. It's fantastic. Yeah, but then, uh, are you going to go through the rest of your life, people saying, how can you top this? Or do you have to do something dramatically different? By Dr dramatically different, I would say. I mean, I don't have a career plan, but I, I mean, people are asking me, the, the common question that I'm getting asked now quite a lot is, um, wow, this, you know, they see me as a, as a as this New Zealand filmmaker that's always lived in New Zealand, yeah. and I've made you know low budget films, and, and now everybody says, "Wow, well, after this, it's going to open all these doors, and you've got the key to the kingdom, and you're going to be able to come to Hollywood and rule Hollywood." And I, I actually just want to stay in New Zealand, <laughs> yes. make, making yes. my stuff down in New Zealand. So, in a funny kind of a way, without wanting to sound sort of ungrateful, <laughs> um, this, 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 I don't see this film really as opening up particularly doors that I care yep. to go through you, you know that I, I sort of I'm an independent filmmaker I have my own little set up in New Zealand that I've mm. been making films down there for 10 or 12 years and I'm very very happy to continue probably, probably make it a little bit easier to get finance for films however yeah you mentioned New Line for a second there and the bet that they're making on this yeah the interesting thing is that I understand it you and always wanted to make the three of them at one time but you presented the idea to Bob Shea to do two, hoping that he would bite and say, "Why not three? Well, there's a there's a there's a long a legend or there's a longer story behind that. If I, I'll try to give you the short version of the long story, if uh -huh. you like, the history of it, because it is very interesting. I mean, people don't realize really how close this film came to not happening at all. It was originally a Miramax production. Um, we started developing it with Miramax in about 1996. You know, quite quite about the rights in '95. Saul Zantz had the rights. He was a very famous producer. Yeah. Made English Patient. English Patient, and we we called Harvey Weinstein and said to Harvey, you know, uh, we'd love to love to do this. We had a first look deal with Miramax, which meant we had to take any any project that we wanted to them. So we called up Harvey and said we'd love to do this. He said, who's got the rights? And we said Saul Zantz. And he said, well, that's great because I'm making the English Patient with Saul right now. And he owes me a big favor because the English patient was about going to not to be made. made, and then Harvey stepped and grabbed it. So, so that was our first piece of great luck: is that Harvey happened to be working with yeah. Saul and Saul had the rights. So, so that legal stuff happened, and and, and the rights became you know became available to Harvey. Um, and so we started to develop it with Harvey. We pitched the idea of three films, and Miramax didn't really want to take that risk, but we agreed on two, two Lord of the Rings films. You know, two and a half hours, like five hours total, which we thought we could we could adapt the book. 
the, the three books in that way. So we did a screenplay. We developed it over the course of about two years. Um, at the same time as writing the scripts, Miramax were also putting a lot of money into basically pre-production on the film. We hired a team of 30 or 40 people. We were designing the movie. We were location scouting. We had visual effects being done. We had monsters being made. Um, <laughs> computer work was happening. A lot of money was, was spent. In fact, it was about a $20 million got spent during this time. And then we ran into a real snag because... By the time we'd finished writing the screenplays and doing a lot of the, the development, we were able to come up with a much more definitive budget of what it was going to spend. And it was going to, at that point, these two movies were going to cost about 130, 140 million to make. And Harvey said, "Well, I, I, I have, uh, I only have an ability to go up to 75 million on a film." And of course, Disney owns his company, so I, I understand. I'm not entirely certain, but I do understand that Harvey went to Disney and he asked permission for to spend extra money to make these two films, and was refused refused that permission. So Harvey was in a real jam and he turned to us and said, look, you know, I've got a problem. I, I just cannot go ahead with these two films, so why don't we just make one? And we said, so you want us to make the first one first and release it, which is sort of the common sense mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then if it's successful, we'll go make the second. And he said, well, no, no, I, I, I just want to make one Lord of the Rings film, so we've got to figure out a way to, to, to lose all the story and to compress mm -hmm. it all into one mm -hmm. movie. So we didn't really feel comfortable with that um, at, at all. In fact, um, we just felt it was a d recipe for disaster. That, that, that anybody that had read the book, that went along to a movie titled The Lord of the Rings, was just going to be was going to be disappointed. Was going to be shocked at what this, yeah, this two-hour right. version was actually going to be like. And we just said, w w why would you do that when it was guaranteed to disappoint? But anyway, Harvey had no real choice, and he said, "This is the only thing I can do." So we, at that point, we literally walked away from the project and we said to Harvey, we, we can't be involved in this anymore. And we'd been on it for two years. So it was a fairly, we were over, we were over here in New York and had this, had this rather gruesome meeting at the Miramax office and just said, look, you know, we, we can't be involved. And Harvey said, I mean, he understood. It was like we were both in a jam and mm -hmm. Harvey's heart was always in the right place, but he, could, he had nowhere to go. And we, um, so we got on the plane back to New Zealand, it's like a 20 hour flight, and we felt now that we'd come to the end of The Lord of the Rings, which was a tragedy, it's, it's because you put so much emotional investment into these, these things when you work on them for, for so long. And, uh, and our agent, Ken Cammons, ha in the meantime, while we were flying that 20 hours back to New Zealand, he'd called Harvey and he said, look, you know, Peter and Fran, who's my, who's my partner, they've been working on this for two years, Harvey, you've got to give them at least a chance to, to, to take this somewhere else. If you can't do it, there may be someone who can. And so Harvey, because Harvey was prepared to hire other filmmakers to make his single film version, because Harvey had spent 20 million and he wasn't able just to kill it. He, he was now going to have to find someone else to do mm -hmm. his, his, mm -hmm. his movie so he could at least get, get his investment back. And so Harvey said, okay, there's, there's, there's two conditions. One, it's got to be, it's got to be the two films. Somebody's got to agree to do two films because I'm offering to do one. So somebody's got to agree to the two. The second condition is who, if somebody wants to do it, they've got to write me, they've got four weeks from now to write me a $20 million check. So we, we were now faced with the job of having to go to LA, to Hollywood, <laughs> and try and convince somebody to write Harvey a $20 million check and, and finance two Lord of the Rings movies. So we, um, we, were in, we arrived in New Zealand with this news and we had four weeks and so we had all this visual material, all our designs, our, our, our creatures. We had a lot of stuff. And rather than just go into a Hollywood office and just like do a verbal pitch, we thought we've got to make use of all this wonderful visual material that we have because it was, it was pretty amazing. And so we decided to make a documentary. <laughs> um, and so for the first week of our, of our four, we got a video team in, we interviewed ourselves, you know, talking about The Lord of the Rings. It was like a, ma a making of The Lord of the Rings <laughs> yeah, but, I said it. Uh, before it got made, you yeah, know. Right, right. And, but the interesting thing with that tape is that, is that we're all trying to sit there and be really positive and confident. And I'm being interviewed and I'm saying, you know, the most wonderful thing about Tolkien's story is that, but, but we're all dying inside because this is like the project is going <laughs> to, unless this works, it's all over and, and we're hoping and we're, but we're trying to not show that and we're all, you know, and so we did all this lovely photography of these these monsters where we turned them on turntables and lighting them and we did it all pretty swish. It ended up being 36 minutes long and so then we got them in week number two we go to LA and we, um, we we now have to hit Hollywood with our, with our, with our videotape and try and get someone to, to do this and, 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 and by the time we arrive in LA um, our agent has gone through every studio, every producer who could possibly raise money and he's virtually been 
turned down by everybody, even without seeing the tape, without meeting us. People just say, no, we don't want to do it. You know, Lord of the Rings, two movies, $20 million check to Harvey. No, 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 no. And, and by the time we arrive in LA, there were only two meetings. There were only two people who wanted to even meet, meet with us. Um, everyone else had passed. And the first one was Polly Graham, um, who, who saw our tape and they loved it. And they said, look, we, this is fantastic. We really, really want to, want to do it. And we thought, great, great. And then they said, but our company, this was 1998. And they said, but our company is being sold. Polygram was now being up, was up for sale, right. and they said there's no way we could do this until the sale process is complete. And we said, well, we've got like you know two and a half weeks. How, how quickly is it going to get sold? And they said, oh no, it's going to be mon <laughs> mon months, months and months away. So that we walked out the door. That was a no go. In one last shot. New Line, New Line Cinema was our last shot. Who had agreed to have a, have a meeting, and at this point we were we were worried that we were going to be known as this failure. So with New Line we. We tried to create the impression that we were really busy taking meetings, and so, you know, we had this one meeting. But like, we'd phone up New Line and say, "Meeting, uh, meeting at New Line, ten o'clock." No, 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 we can't do ten. We've got a meeting. No, one o'clock. No, we're busy at one. How about three thirty? And we tried to create this impression that we were kind of really <laughs> being sought after, and we were going because I mean, it's terrible, isn't it? But, and you had nothing. But we had nothing. No, so we turned up. We turned up at our New Line meeting, and. Um, Mark Odeski, you know, who's an executive at New yeah. Line, who, who, who was an old friend of mine in actual fact, and I knew that he was a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Mark had set it up, and Mark was, Mark was really excited about the idea of doing this. And I met Bob Shea, who I'd known earlier, and Bob is a really straight guy, so, you know, we knew we'd get, you know, we'd get some sense from Bob of what he, he was going to do. So we sat down, he, um, he, he had a private meeting with me first, and he said, look, Peter, I just want to, before I see your tape, I just want you to know that if we don't do this, I, I want you to know that you're always welcome to bring projects to me in the future. So I thought, oh, well, this is the classic yeah, right. kind he's of... He's setting you up for the fall. setting me up for the fall. So we went and we put the tape in and, we, and he plays it. And, and he just sits there completely silently, just watches it, and, and we're just nervous. We can't stand it. He's in the, we're in the same room as he is, and he's just watching, watching for 36 minutes. Mm -hmm. And as the tape comes to an end, he says, I, I, I don't get it. And I, and I thought, oh, okay. And he turns and he says, I don't get it. Why, why would you be wanting to do two Lord of the Rings films? It's three books, isn't it? Shouldn't, shouldn't it be three films? <laughs> and, and I thought, what's he, what's he saying here? What's he, what's he saying here? And he said, um, he said look, uh, look, we're interested, yeah. but we're basically interested in three movies. And, and, and that was... That, I, I, mean, I hope you got up and went over and kissed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I felt like hugging him, yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable. And now, you know, it, th these sorts of stories don't really happen. Yeah. They are not, so not, you left there saying, right. I want to make three movies, we're going to go back to New Zealand. We went back to New Zealand. The, the Miramax and, and, and New Line lawyers got hammering it out. Right. Uh, Harvey got, got his check. Right. And we Plus were, he got 5%. We too, were on board. Yeah, no, Harvey, Harvey's done fine. And a title and, um, as executive producer or yeah, something well, like he, that. Well, he deserves it. I mean, Harvey was there at the very beginning and, and gave us a lot, lot of support when we needed it. So, oh. it, you know, it, it's sort of, it's, every, everybody's come out okay. Okay, so all of a sudden, it's a go. You're going to yes. spend how much money for three movies? Well, at that point, you see, we only had budgets for two movies. So then we had to write, rewrite the scripts. So we had to throw out our scripts. We had to re rewrite the scripts because the scripts for three films is a very different structure to two. So that was, a, that was another 18 months. I mean, this is now getting into 1999. They budget out at, uh, they ended up budgeting it out at 270 million because we were able to put a whole lot more stuff back into the movies that we'd cut out. And then, and, you know, and, and, and we went into basically into production in October 1999 to shoot all three movies, $270 million budget, uh, 274 shooting days, um, and we got going. Talk about casting. The casting for The Lord of the Rings was vital. It was vital on, on several levels. Um, it was vital, one, because it's one of the most beloved books of all time. And everybody that reads that book has a mental image of these people in their minds. And, and we do, too. I mean, we're, we're fans of the book. So we were determined to get the casting right, that we had to, to cast people that felt like they had stepped out of the pages of the book. We didn't want to cast big stars because that is distracting. I mean, I think if, you, if, you're, taking, if you're taking characters from a famous book and bringing them to life, you don't want a, a, a huge superstar face because it, the book and the, the star kind of don't kind of gel. We, we, we wanted wonderful actors who are like chameleons who could just bring the characters from the book to life first and foremost. Secondly, it was important because we were asking our cast to come down to New Zealand where we were shooting 
for 15 months. I mean, really 18 months because they had to come down six weeks ahead for rehearsals and yeah. some sort of thing. So we, we, we're saying we, are, we were asking all of our actors to leave their, their homes, their families, or bring their families with them, come down to the strange country that they'd never been to for 18 months. So we wanted to make sure that we were casting people that really were prepared to, to commit to that. And, and the byproduct of that, which, which I, I have come to realize, I didn't really think about it at the time, is that the spirit of the cast was wonderful because I realized that none of these people were actually making a job decision. They, were, they weren't making a, what's, what's my next film going to be? Oh, I think I might just do this film. You know, I've got three or four I can choose. I'll, I'll do, I'll do Lord, Lord of the Rings. I mean, because it, it wasn't that. Normally, they'd be on a movie for three or four months. I mean, the decision to come to New Zealand for 18 months was like a lifestyle decision, mm -hmm. much more so than just a gig. And so we ended up with actors down in New Zealand that basically... As a, as, a, as a group felt, well, we're not going to spend this amount of time on a single project without ending up with something we're really proud of. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't happen on every movie. It's like, this was not a job. This was like 18 months. Mm -hmm. I, I want this to be great yeah. because I'm here for 18 months and they just arrived. They just yeah. said, let's get going. This is, we want this to be great. And, and that, that, that lasted through the entire shoot. And I actually think that spirit is a spirit of, it's the spirit of putting your heart and soul into something. Um, and that, I think that shows on the screen. Yeah. I think that really comes yeah. across on the screen. And New Zealand as a place contributed to that for you as the movie. Well, New Zealand uh, as a location for The Lord of the Rings is perfect. I, you know, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm a New Zealand filmmaker and I, I live and work there, so for me it was easy. But I think that if any filmmaker anywhere in the world was doing The Lord of the Rings, New Zealand would be like right up on the location. Because it's an unspoiled Britain, so to speak? Yeah. Well, you know, Tolkien, I mean, the Middle Earth that Tolkien wrote about was, is not, is not a, 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 on another planet. It's, 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 it's a mythic prehistory of Europe. Yeah. And so these sort of New Zealand has these unspoiled kind of primitive um, European landscapes, essentially. Yeah. All right, talk about the cast. And let, first of all, we'll see in a minute Frodo, but Elijah mm. Wood. Yeah. The most important casting? The, the most important casting. You know, I mean, you know, t the, the problem with getting the casting wrong, if you, if you cast a Frodo, for instance, that sort of irritated you, you know, and you always see movies where somebody <laughs> anno annoys you, bugs you, <laughs> yeah. then, then we, were, we, were not, we were not sort of spoiling one film, we were spoiling three movies. <laughs> yeah. So, the ca you know, it was a lot of lot riding on it. And Frodo is a very, very important character in the movies, but he's also an incredibly difficult character to play and to cast, in actual fact, because... I, I always regard Frodo as being the everyman character. That you know, when you read the book, this is like from the book. That when you read it, I think you sort of channel you channel a lot of your imagination through the character of Frodo in the book because he's experiencing the journey. He's the innocent. He's like us. I mean, we're like the hobbits, really. And and um, he's going these places. He's going places that we'd never want to go, and he doesn't want want to go. You know, and yet he's having to deal with it. So, so he's. So in a way, Frodo is the audience of the film, and those sorts of characters are, are fiendishly difficult for actors to play because they, they, they have no gimmicks, you know, they have no quirks. So tell me why Elijah. Well, I, I, I'll tell you about Elijah. I mean, we, we were convinced that Frodo was going to be an English actor because we wanted the Hobbits to basically be English as, as Tolkien really wrote them. Um, so we went to London and we started auditioning. We, didn't, we, did, we, we, we couldn't think of any actor to play Frodo. I mean, you know, names like Ian McKellen immediately came sure. up for Gandalf right. and Ian Holm for right. Bilbo, but, but Frodo we had nobody in mind. So we thought it would be an unknown English actor, young, young kid. So we went to England. We auditioned. We were in London auditioning for about a month, and we had, I, we'd probably seen about 300 Frodo's, <laughs> young English actors. Um, there were two or three that were okay, but nothing, nothing magical, you know, because Frodo had to be magical. 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 Yeah. And every time the casting room door opened and, and some young, nervous, nervous young actor would come in, you, 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 were, you were saying, is this going to be Frodo? And you sort of know within 10 seconds that it wasn't, yeah. really, it wasn't really Frodo. And it was, it was a worry, but we were plugging on. And then our casting director, John Hubbard, um, said to us one day when we arrived to do some more casting, he just said, oh, a package has just come in the mail. And we said, oh, yeah. He said, it's from Elijah Wood. And, and, and it was a videotape, a VHS tape, just in a, in a package sent to London. And I, I had heard Elijah, Elijah's name, but I'd never seen a, a film he'd done. So actually, I actually had no face for Elijah. I didn't know what Elijah look, looked like. But Fran Walsh, my partner, had seen The Ice Storm. And she said, oh, no, no, this, this, this kid's pretty good. He's, 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 he's an American, but he's got this really interesting face. And 
So we put the videotape in, and Elijah had, um, basically, he was in L.A. And, and heard that we were in London and weren't going to come to L.A. And so he'd, um, he, he really wanted to, to, to get this role, and so he'd, had hi he'd hired a dialect coach to teach him. This is all what he did himself without us even knowing about it. Hired a dialect coach, teach him an accent. He'd gone to the local costume hire, and he'd got this sort of cheesy kind of hobbit costume on. He'd gone up into the trees somewhere up um, behind his house with a friend, and he'd just videotaped his own audition where he was, because he didn't have our script, so he was reading from the book, and he was like doing Frodo parts from the book. And, and I just put, I put this videotape in and um, literally, I mean, not having known who Elijah Wood was really, I just thought, he's wonderful, he's absolutely great. Bingo. Bingo. And so Elijah, Elijah cast himself. Roll tape. Here's a scene in which uh, Frodo is being chased by the evil dark riders and he decides to leave the Shire. Get the rope stuck! Then there is Ian McKellen. Yes. Now Ian was quite different to Elijah. Ian was a, a, a name that we had right from the very beginning, where, where we thought about all the perfect Gandalfs. Who would be the perfect Gandalf? It was fantasy casting. We, could, we, we were the lucky people that could sit there with the Lord of the Rings and say, now uh, if we were making a movie, who would we cast? Because we were, we were making a movie and we had to cast somebody. So um, we, um, Ian McKellen was it from, from day one. For, for us, I mean, we, no we, other we, choice. No, no, we no never, we, Anthony Hopkins. No, no, no. Anthony Hopkins, we thought would be interesting for Bilbo, but then, um, but then we, we but, but we fell in love with Ian Holm, and we we love love the idea of Ian Holm. Why McKellen? We wanted obviously an English actor. We wanted an English actor of a certain stature, and we wanted somebody who would bring Gandalf to life um, in a way that that didn't. He's, he's, a, he's a chameleon, Ian. That's what I love about Ian. Is he, he's not an actor who, who puts his own stuff right in your face when he's playing a role. He, he absorbs himself into this character and, he, and out comes the character emerges. And that's the sort of actor that we wanted. And we wanted somebody, obviously, who can... I mean, the Shakespearean quality of Ian as his experience was perfect for, for Tolkien because Tolkien's language is kind of heightened. And it's not easy. It's not easy to say the dialogue that Gandalf has to say in the film without it sounding a bit cheesy. So, so you know, you need a great actor to make it sound wonderful to go from the cheesy to the to the, to the great in one in one uh, easy step. And so, Ian is obviously wonderful at um, just being able to to be uh, wonderfully believable. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. And I tell you what, I mean, people, people should just realize how absolutely difficult this role was to play because I, I have a huge dislike of wizards. In films and books, I mean, wizards are not great characters. And the Lord of the Rings, obviously, my biggest problem was the fact that you have a wizard, which you, who, in a sense, in one way, they've become cliches. So they've become cliches since the Lord of the Rings. I mean, Tolkien created this character, and since then, and since the 1950s, everybody has obviously just done versions of Gandalf and all sorts of different things. So, this is the prototype. But nonetheless, it's the long beard, it's the pointy hat, it's the staff. It's what you, you know, imagine a cliched wizard to be like. And so Ian, Ian and I worked very, very hard to, to basically play him not as a cliched wizard at all, but to take, to take a lead, obviously, from Tolkien, because Tolkien had, had, Tolkien had designed a character in Gandalf who is an ancient spirit, a very powerful spirit, an immortal who never dies, who's been sent down to Middle Earth to combat evil, to help fight this evil. And he is, for some reason, I don't quite know why, but he ends up being put in the body of an old man. So you've basically got a, a mind which is which is which is young and vibrant, and, and but you've got he's stuck in this old carcass. 
and with creaky bones and he doesn't have the energy that he really wants and it's frustrating for him being stuck in this body and that, that, that leads to all sorts of interesting possibilities. You said about this that you wanted the costumes and the actors to give the audience a sense of authenticity. That make, make it real. Make it real. That's, I, th I thought that was important because the fantasy genre in terms of movies, I don't think has ever really succeeded wonderfully well. I mean, there's been some movies that have been okay, but they... Uh, Hollywood seems to lack confidence in this particular genre for some reason. Um, and, you know, you can name, over the last hundred years of cinema, you can name the great westerns and the great spy movies and the great cowboy films, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the great musicals, you know, but the great fantasy films, I mean, it's a genre that's, that, that, that no one has really kind of come to terms with very well, I, I believe, and, uh, I, and, and, and I wanted, I, th I thought, well, we need to reinvent the genre a little bit, and I just thought, well, you know, why don't we just take our lead again from Tolkien, I mean, it's there in the book, he, he wasn't writing fantasy, I don't believe in the 12 years that he was sitting down in his little attic room up in his house writing this thing in, in longhand. I don't believe for a minute he thought he was writing a, writing a fantasy story. Not one minute. He was a, an Oxford professor who was, who dedicated his life to a love of mythology, um, ancient mythology, which is not fantasy. There's a, it's very different. Mythology is different than fantasy. And, 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 and Tolkien always mourned the fact that England's mythology had been eradicated by the Norman invasion in 1066. The mythology is based on oral stories that are passed down from generation to generation before the printing presses. And, you know, the Greek mythologies of the Trojan horse and Achilles and things, they survived through the years. The, the great Norse sagas survived through the years. But England, when the Normans invaded, whatever stories had been nurtured were eradicated by that. that and, and so England's mythology was like medieval stuff like Robin Hood and King, King Arthur. I mean, it didn't go any further back than that. So, so Tolkien thought he wanted to create a mythology for his country, for England. And this is what he did. He spent his lifetime doing the stories of Middle Earth and the Sagra, you know. And, and, and the history, the history of the mythology, the, 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 the concept, because he always says, he said, I imagine this took place in England and Europe um, some seven or eight thousand years ago. This is this, and, and so we thought, okay, okay. So what we'll do with the movie is we will we will pretend that this is history, it, it, just as if we were making an ancient Roman film or making Braveheart, you know, about Sir William Wallace, you know, you know that we'll pretend that that these guys existed. It's history. It was real. That that let's let's make the movie with that weight of authentic of, of authenticity in the designs, the look, the performances, everything. So. So that, um, that was our mantra. You said that you made the movie, uh, that you didn't make the movie that Tolkien would have made, but you made the movie he would have enjoyed. Well, I, I hope he would have enjoyed it. I've got no idea whether he would have enjoyed it. I, but you had some reason to say that. I, I made, a, we, what we tried to do with the movie, um, because there's also a lot of themes in Tolkien, obviously, more than just the plot. There, like there, there's what? all this. Well, there's... Um, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of themes in Tolkien, friendship. I mean, he was... Mentorship, men. He was in the First World War. He was, he was in the trenches. He, he went into World War I with his classmates, you know, his school chums, and by the end of World War I, only, only two of them were still alive. Um, he, saw, he saw men die. He saw friendship under fire. He understood what, what, what that was like, and Frodo and Sam's relationship was very much based on that. He said he was born a hundred years too late, that he would have liked to have lived in England in a pre-industrial age in the early 1800s, before, in the middle of that century, the chimneys and the factories started sort of spreading across the landscape. And a lot of The Lord of the Rings is about that, the destruction of forests and the, the rise of metal and machines. He hated machines. He said that the most evil creation ever visited on this, on this world was the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. And um, and he hated the idea of of, of 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 people being slaves to the machine. Like when we turn on the TV, the, the TV is controlling us now. We're slaves to the to the television. We're slaves to to the to the motor car. We're the that the ring in the movie in the book the the ring is 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 a symbol for the loss of free will. That the ring takes away your free will. He also and obviously. It's relevant today, but it was written. You know, this book was largely written in the 1940s. Um, one of the one of the strong themes that you know everyone talks about the good versus evil, which is kind of 
true, but but in particular, he was he, he a strong theme of the Lord of the Rings is that if you if you turn your back on the lessons of the past, if you ignore what's gone before you, and he's obviously probably talking about post World War One Germany mm -hmm. um, and, and and what happened during the 30s. Um, if you turn your back, if you ignore what 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 is happening, and you, and 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 you and you don't learn from the lessons of the past, you know you will suffer. Now, did you have some kind of mechanism, in a sense, so that you could make sure that you were true to Tolkien? Well, we 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 didn't want to put any of our own. Certainly, in terms of the thematic material, we didn't want to put any of our own baggage. I mean, we had no interest in putting our messages in, <laughs> into this movie, but we thought that we should honour Tolkien by putting his messages into it. And we thought he cared about things. We, you know, he, you know, the countryside and the, and the, and, and, and the rise of evil, and and he he cared passionately about certain issues. And we thought what we should do to honour him is to make sure that 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 his what he cared about ends up in the movie. That's what we tried to do. Someone, one of your actors, said that there was that the most inspired moments of making this movie came from doubt and panic. <laughs> <laughs> When you're when you're in any movie, you are basically um, you, you have a feeling. Once you start shooting, it's the shooting of the movie, the the, the thing, and obviously that's when the actors are involved. You are uh, you're you're on a train. You can't get off because the machine starts rolling. You know, upwards of a million dollars a day is being spent by this huge organisation. That and and it often feels. It doesn't. It's not only just like you're you're on a train, you can't get off. It feels like you're running in front of the train, laying the rails down, as the things the things coming up behind you, and um, and you, it, it creates a, a very exciting adrenaline pumping kind of ti cre creative time when you know you you wake up in the morning at the end of the, uh, this day you've got to shoot this part of the movie. You're not going to get any other time to do it because it's got to be done today. Um, and often in our case, you know, at the end of the day, we were all getting in buses and driving to a completely different location. So we didn't even have a possibility of coming back tomorrow to finish it. So you just you just go there and you want to make the best film you can, and and you just you just this just, just it's just creative energy that happens. One thing you added to this is uh, female characters. We didn't add female characters. We expanded a little bit. We ah, when Liv Tyler's character was really the one that we um, expanded slightly, not not a, not a huge amount. In order to do to serve an audience. Well, it, it wasn't for commercial reasons. I mean, if we were strictly commercial, you know, Liv would have been in the film from the beginning to the end. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, if we were, if we, because she's obviously wonderful, and the more the more that Liv lives in it, the better, really, to some degree, from a commercial point of view. But, but. That obviously would not have would not have been Tolkien. No, um, the character of Arwen, who who live who live plays very very wonderfully. Um, she is barely in the book. I mean, she's just such a, a a a tiny character in terms of what Tolkien wrote, and yet she yet she does play an important part because she is the elf. She's an elf. She's an immortal. She she never dies. She lives forever, and she and is in love with Aragorn, and Aragorn mm. is a mortal man, just like we are. He has a lifespan, a natural lifespan, and the the only way that the two of them can be together is if she gives up her immortal life and 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 and, and becomes a, and stays with him and dies with him, and so it's a wonderful, <laughs> bittersweet love story that's there in the book, and we just simply wanted to have a little bit more screen time to sort of to make mm. that work for the movie, um, so, so we did. To enhance it a little bit, yeah, expand yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Aragon, here's where Frodo meets Aragon, played by uh, Viggo Mortensen. What do you want? A little more caution from you. That is no trinket you carry. I carry nothing. Indeed. I can avoid being seen if I wish, but to disappear entirely, that is a rare gift. Who are you? Are you frightened? Yes. Not nearly frightened enough. I know what hunts you. Who's the audience for this movie? Is it adults and kids? It's, yeah, it's a whole, yeah, it's a whole range. Eight, mm. eight to eighty. Eight to <laughs> <laughs> And beyond. <laughs> you had Final Cut? Well, yeah. yeah uh, I can't remember on our contract. I think I share Final Cut with Bob Shea, but you know it was a very collaborative process. And um, I mean, as you know, I, I just had the most wonderful experience as a filmmaker because there was never any real argument or conflict. That 
any time we had disagreements, we'd sit down, we'd listen to each other's points of view. New Line were very collaborative. And, you know, I mean, as, as a filmmaker, and as an independent filmmaker, as somebody who does pride their independence and doesn't consider themselves a studio guy, I, um, I have no complaints. I mean, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful filmmaking experience for me. Nothing, now that you look at it, mm. that you would have, I mean, do differently? Um, well, it's probably a better question to ask me in 10 years' time because uh, that's when you get a little bit more perspective on the film. I, you know, I, I've just finished cutting an alternative version of The Fellowship of the Ring, which was interesting because... Why would you do that? Well, for the DVD. Ah. Oh. Because we... Obviously, theatrically, you see, we, we had a lot riding on this, this movie, as we discussed. I mean, you know, a huge amount at stake. The first film had to work at the box office or it would have been... It, it would have been something you don't even want to want to want to th want to think about. It, it would have been terrible. So, um, so we you know we had a lot of a lot of there was a lot of discussion obviously about how long the film has to be. And I, and I obviously believe ultimately that films should be as long as they need to be because a film is is something that you just have to feel your way through it as, you, as you're cutting it. And we we ultimately you know obviously had a movie that was nearly three hours long, which commercially is a little bit risky, but nonetheless we, we everybody felt strongly that the film worked at that length. But in doing so, we certainly we cut it at a pretty quick pace, we, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think that three hours people enjoy it, because most people come out of it saying they did, it didn't feel like three hours, and I think that's that is because it paces long. But but what we what we had to uh, what we had to lose in our cutting process is a lot of little character moments, where where most of the characters, in fact, have wonderful little scenes where they get developed, where we learn more about you know Aragorn and, we, and Merry and Pippin mm -hmm. and the guys, and so um, I've, we just. I've just recently, just before I came over here actually last week, I, I finished cutting a DVD version of the film which is 30 minutes longer. So there's now a three and a half hour version of this movie, which I, which I love. I love the fact that DVD, it's not really a director's cut, because I, I consider the director's cuts the one that went out in the movies. But this is like an alternative extended mm -hmm. version um, for people that would like to see it. So and what so, would I see in that version I don't see in the original version? You'll see a lot of scenes, a lot of scenes. Um, you know, the, the, the 30 minutes of extra footage is like sprinkled all the way throughout. from the I see. From so the it's not one whole... It's, well, not little, one sequence it's of little character moments. There's little character developments okay. where they pause. They, it's, it's a couple of guys have a little scene together and then they move on. I mean, it's, 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 good. it's, it's pretty good stuff, actually. Um, and, and I looked at that and I thought, well, this is actually... This is this is good. Um, it, I don't think it would have been a good idea to release that version in the cinemas, but um, it's good that people will be able to see it on DVD. Hmm. Your fascination with the notion of escapism, yeah, is what? Well, I believe strongly um, in, in in breaking the barrier when you go see movies, and what I mean by that is that um, obviously the movie-going process is one in which you walk into a darkened theatre, you sit in a chair, and 20 feet away there's a screen and you watch the screen and when I was a kid as we all were I'm sure the same to you <laughs> yes. every time I used to go to the movies when I was 12 I'd leave my chair I wouldn't be in my chair anymore I'd just go into the screen and I'd be I'd be there I would just be <laughs> lost in the film and as an adult that doesn't happen very often to me anymore now you know and I don't know whether it's because I'm getting older or because the films aren't, aren't, aren't doing that anymore but I was I tried as much as I possibly could with The Lord of the Rings to, to recreate that type of movie where it's where where the um, the audience can just get lost and just go into the movie and just become part of the film because that is um, your passion whether yeah. it's this kind of genre or not yeah is that what you think distinguishes you as a filmmaker, uh, I don't some know. Some sense of being urgent about that idea. I, I mean, Hitchcock. Um, Hitchcock came up with my favourite quote as a as a film quote. He he once said, uh, "Some people's films are slices of life. Mine are slices of cake." <laughs> and I love that. And that does that. That's where my heart is. <laughs> slices of cake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any, what was the most difficult hurdle to overcome? For example, yeah. you've got characters of different size. Yeah, that was pretty So you've got to figure the relationship. Oh, yeah. And we've got them all through the movie. I mean, yeah, that and was... they react with each other. And so everything has to be different. Yeah. The size of a glass yeah. in your hands can't be the size of a glass if I'm a little person. No, no, no. We had to build a lot, a lot of things twice. Um, you know, a lot of sets had to be built, built twice. Bag End, which is a set that we've seen in some of the um, clips here where... 
you know, Gandalf and Frodo are talking where the Ringo's in the fire, for instance. That, that, that was quite a large set, a whole little building, a little hobbit house, and we had to build that twice so that when Elijah was shooting his scenes, he was in a bag end that was the appropriate size for Elijah as a hobbit. So the ceilings were quite high and there were books on the shelves and yeah. chairs that he could, he could sit in. And then for all of the shots of Ian McKellen, he wasn't in the same set. He was next door in an in a, in exactly identical set, but about two-thirds of the size. So that Ian's one, he had to stoop under to get under the doorways and if he stood up he banged his head on the on the roof and it was too because he's a big guy the hobbit he's much taller than the hobbits and so he he didn't fit into bag in very well but that meant that even the chairs which were all hand carved they had to be replicated smaller the tables the books the stuff on the floor the rubbish everything had to be made smaller for, for his version so a lot of things had to be built, built at two different sizes and um it, i mean this was one of those movies where where every single thing in the film had to be built yet there was not one item we could go to a uh, a props warehouse and rent and we had to also then think, think of the cultures because because the lord of the rings tells a multicultural kind of story so in the hobbits the hobbits are eating with knives and forks now when you go to the where the elves live they've got knives and forks but they can, they have to be completely different because yeah. those knives and forks i mean you know so we we studied we thought now if you're an elf and you're immortal, and you live for three thousand years. What would what would your knife and fork be like? I mean, what 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 what, what design influences yeah. would have steered you towards coming up with with something that you, know, you use to 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 to, uh, to uh, cut your Brussels sprout with? So we we had to, we put a huge amount of thought into the cultural design. I mean, Richard Taylor, Grant Major, Alan Lee. I mean, a lot of wonderful designers who fortunately are all people that have been, are up for these Oscars now, so I'm so pleased that their work has been celebrated in that way because I, I tell you, everything, thousands and thousands of things had to be made, at, all with a th view to creating a fictitious cultural backgrounds to, to influence the design of these different places that we go to. A answering Tolkien's question about himself, what period of history would you prefer to have lived in? I... Um, well, I, I'm 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 reasonably comfortable with with uh, with, with today, actually. <laughs> because you live in New Zealand, or <laughs> well, and I and I like TVs and things. I um yeah. I, I I don't really, yeah. and the internal combustion engines okay. And cell phones and, and cell phones are okay, and movie cameras, movie cameras and cinemas. I mean, I I love the movies, so I guess I actually I, I would find it hard to imagine a world without movies. To be completely honest, what is that about? Oh, it's just I mean, it's escapism, as I say. It's just the about storytelling too. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, if you were living two or three hundred years ago, you it would be oral stories. It would be sitting around, telling tales around. No, the but the, the attraction of you in, in movies is it gives you the tools to tell movie, tell stories. Um, well, I, I love telling stories because I love having stories told to me. I mean, I love movies. I'm a movie fan. I, I I've loved going to see movies as long as I can remember, and uh, and through loving movies as an audience, I, I've come to love the ability to, to, to make them. Could you have made A Beautiful Mind? Um, probably. I mean, you know, in, in some respects, he Heavenly Creatures is, is, is not the same subject, subject matter as A Beautiful Mind, but it's certainly that type of mo movie. It's a psychological drama. So I've done that, yeah. In yeah, the bedroom you're going to make it? Um, don't know. I mean, In the Bedroom is not, not, not quite the slice of cake. <laughs> <laughs> that I'd be going after. Could you make King Kong? I'd love to make King Kong. Why? Uh, well, the original King Kong is my is my all time favorite film, the 1933 version. I saw that when I was 10, which was the reason why I, I wanted to become a filmmaker. Actually, is, is seeing King Kong. That's the the ultimate escapist film. And I, I was working on a remake of King Kong for a while, um, and then. Universal, the studio who who were doing it, uh, decided not 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 to go ahead with it, and we we had Lord of the Rings kind of in the wings at that point, so we were able to j to uh, jump straight onto that project. But King King Kong's great. Will you ever get the chance to make it? I, I hope so. I, I um, it's a Universal question, really. They'd have to come and uh, decide. They'd have to come back and then decide to do it. But, <laughs> well, um, I assume I assume the chances they'll do that is. Yeah, it's accelerated I accelerated mean, because of Lord. Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple of smaller films we, we want we want to make. I mean, Fran and I are um, 
I mean, Heavenly Creatures, which 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 is a which is a New Zealand-based drama film set in the fifties, a, a true life story. That that was a wonderful experience for us. We love making that film, and so we're probably going to follow up the Lord of the Rings with a couple a couple of you know smaller, more drama-based mm. um, um, films of that sort. I mean, she's been your partner for in the filmmaking business for a while. Yeah, well, Fran, Fran and I have got two kids, um, so, mm -hmm. so 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 we're, we're partners in life as well, and. Uh, Yep, she's, she, she and I have worked together on films for, you know, for the last 12, 12 or 13 years, yeah. Mm. When you look at movies today, you know, what do you like about the way they are going or what don't you like? I think Hollywood, um, Hollywood has is, is, is stopped taking risks. Holly, Hollywood um, has become a little bit safe and a little bit of recycling the stuff we liked. And, and in a sense, I, 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 what I feel very proud about this particular year, um, and I really hope it helps influence films that are made all around the world, not just Hollywood, but it's actually interesting that, that down under New Zealand and Australia, with Lord of the Rings from New Zealand and Moulin Rouge from, from Australia, that, that two films from that part of the world have, in a sense, you know, they've reinvigorated their particular genres, that we did fantasy and Baz did the musical and you know both films are being uh, you know are being sort of celebrated in, 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 in a way for sort of in, for breathing new life into into these genres and uh, you know I really would love to see more of that risk risk taking and an and imaginative kind of just just go for it um, happening with some of the big budget Hollywood films that are being made because that, that's they, they seem to have forgotten how to do that a little bit much success at the Oscars Thank you. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Peter Jackson, director, The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, the most Academy Award nominations uh, currently seen in theaters around the country. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.